I kind of looked up and I saw just a wall of snow coming right towards me. And I'm on my snowmobile. Snowmobile's not running, so I immediately try to like start my snowmobile. I give it one pull and all of a sudden this wall just hits me. Welcome to The Practical Filmmaker, an educational podcast brought to you by the Filmmaker Institute and Sunscreen Film Festival, where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts and the steps they took to find their success today. On today's show, Justin Fan pitches us into the world of action sports and the filmmakers behind the extreme athletes boarding, skiing, biking, all the things for films brought to you by Teton Gravity Research. Find the full transcripts and more at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. I'm your host, Tanya Musgrave, and today we have Justin Fan editor, director, and cinematographer for the action sports media company, Teton Gravity Research. You can see his work in collaboration with Outside Magazine, last year's Teton Gravity film, Blank Canvas, and their currently touring film, Stoke the Fire. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the, uh, the invite and yeah, excited to be here and excited to chat. So to fill people in, for those who are unfamiliar with outdoor films, there are action sports media companies such as Teton Gravity Research that will usually compile like a feature every year amongst other outdoor film shorts. Think of Warren Miller Ski Film, Banff Mountain Film Fest, Real Rock Tour. They create these films and instead of releasing these to all theaters at once necessarily, they might ha like, they'll have teams that will tour around the country with it. So if you're into the outdoors at all and you've never been to one of these, just go. You're in for a treat. It's such a cool atmosphere. Always sponsored gear giveaways and just a fun time that inspires you to get outside. This world rotates on an axis that is kind of completely different than the typical mainstream film industry. Like, I, I went to see Stoke the Fire, loved it, wanted to get a filmmaker on here, went to IMDb, and it wasn't even registered as a film, <laughs> um, which is crazy because I know that these films have, like, such a massive subculture around them. It was almost baffling once I realized how little I knew about this world. That's one reason I'm so stoked to have you here, um, help shed some light on this gnarly little outcropping. Let's start with how you got to where you are now. First off, thanks for having me on the show. Stoked to uh, yeah. be a part of it. I think like a lot of people in kind of the action sports world, I started with just doing the sports and really enjoying, you know, skateboarding, snowboarding, all that stuff as a kid, running around with a little video camera and, and it was the era of jackass and jumping into bushes and, you know, filming your friends <laughs> doing stupid shit. And uh, yeah. so I did a bunch of that in like, you know, junior high and kind of my, my younger teen years. And then I went to school in Moscow, Idaho. I went for environmental science. And about my like junior year, I wasn't quite sure I was there for the right reasons. I wasn't quite sure I was studying what I wanted to do. And I'd never really thought about film as, as a career path, really. But then that, that, I believe it was my second or third semester of my junior year, the film uh, Deeper came to the student union building and showed there. And after watching that film, I kind of like had this little bit of an aha moment of like, wow, like, I think I want to do that. I think I want to like go back to this like filmmaking thing that was just sort of this hobby as a kid and yeah. see if I can, you know, take a take a crack at it. Yeah. So the next week I went into my my uh, advisor and I added a minor in digital media production and, and crammed as much as I could into the last year or so I had of, of school and Flash forward to a year from there, and I was interning at Teton Gravity Research in 2011, and and uh, that oh, following wow. winter, I was actually cutting a TV show out of the film Deeper. So it was such a whirlwind oh, of uh, kind of okay. happen chance that that got me to this place. Okay, so I'm guessing were you already familiar with Teton Gravity Research, or were they just kind of like one of those? Yeah, yeah, I was definitely familiar with it. You know, I'd followed like the annual film, you know, as you yeah. mentioned. Uh, Companies like yeah. Teton Gravity Research and Warren Miller kind of do an annual ski film every year that that is, you know, something that the ski community always looks forward to. It gets the excitement going, yeah. builds the the stoke for mm -hmm. winter to come. And, and uh, so I was familiar with their work in that sense. But uh -huh. the deeper, further, higher kind of trilogy that they uh, released and they started in 2010, I believe, is when it first came out. That was a little bit more of their kind of entry into a, a bigger storytelling kind of space, I feel like. So for outdoor filmmakers who are wanting to make a break into this, like, are there other, you wouldn't necessarily call them studios, I guess, but kind of like these kind of uh, similar companies, where would they start? Like, cause I, I know that Teton Gravity has a place where you can upload videos 
and you can kind of be part of that community. I mean, is that kind of where people find other filmmakers? Over the last five years or so, I mean, it, it's continued to grow and it's become obviously like a much more saturated space. There's a lot more filmmakers out there, a lot more people you know, enjoying these sports in these places. And there's all sorts of ways you can get into it from just sort of doing it on your own and, and kind of figuring out along the way. Um, I know there's there's school programs now that are kind of focused on more outdoor adventure filmmaking kind of things. But really, I would say it's just it's just kind of practicing what you do. You know, one thing that, that TGR actually does these days, it's called the Grom Contest. And uh, every year they have like a little entry for kids, I think it's 17 and under, to make yeah. their own little ski edit or snowboard edit. Um, we're also doing a, a bike one these days. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's kind of another little way that kids can kind of get fired up on the idea of, you know, filming themselves skiing, put together a little edit. Um, and then the okay. winner, you know, takes home some some prize package. So, yeah, I think there's there's all sorts of ways to, to kind of get into it. But I think more or less it's it's finding the, the sport you want to be in, the, the type of films you'd like to make and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, exploring all the options. I remember seeing one of these films and for the first time they showed a shot of the whole crew together. Yet again, I was shocked at how many there were. I mean, it was the size of a typical film crew, like 30 to 40. I mean, this wasn't just some kid like skiing in front of someone else with a GoPro. I mean, where our typical sets might have, you know, specific roles like a first AD and a second AC, like all the way down to PAs. What roles exist on your quote unquote sets? Like, are there any crossovers? Like, I couldn't look up any credits. <laughs> well, there's there's no craft services. I will tell you that. There's no craft ah. services out there, which is a bummer. I wish there was, you know, hot chocolate and coffee flying, but uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it's yeah. not the case deep in the back country. You know, it, it all kind of depends on the shoot. You know, I think maybe some of the ones that you've seen of the bigger crews, those are typically kind of in more of the controlled areas, the inbounds the park shoots, those kind of things. Okay. I would say typically, you know, 90% of the time when we're out there at the crew, it's usually about four, three to four cinematographers, you know, two primary angles, typically a drone operator, and then, you know, like an on-slope um, would be kind of a good crew. Mm-hmm. And the position that I'm usually in is called the Barbie position is what we call it. And Barbie okay. is essentially just the opposing ridge of the mountain that the athlete is riding down you know so you're able to get that kind of straight on look it gives you the most like scale for what they're riding the steepness the pitch of what they're riding Um, and so that's kind of where i'm typically at is in that barbie position but yeah aside from those kind of four camera crew members we typically try to have at least one dedicated safety person you know obviously the environment that we're working in is extremely unpredictable you know you can do all your studying of of avalanche conditions and terrain and all those things but at the end of the day there's there's factors that are out of your control so we always try to have somebody that's on safety that's just kind of there and that's their sole focus is to if something goes wrong if an avalanche happens if an injury or a crash you know their focus is try to get to the person as quick as possible so i think you know that's that's kind of the general layout of the crew that we have you know and and again our craft service guy unfortunately doesn't make it out there that often (laughs) So the outdoor community is just like really good about taking care of each other. But also, you know, you could get one bad apple who's just like, no, we're just going to get the shot. And, you know, like no regard to safety, not taking care of the crew. Like what is there besides, you know, your own moxie that speaks up for yourself <laughs> um, being like, bro, I haven't. Sure, eaten. sure, sure. Um, yeah. You know, like, is it is it a typical thing where, you know, like, do they do they cover a meal? Like, is it like, you know, uh, union rules, I think, is like you eat every six hours. And I'm just guessing like, hey, if you guys have a I don't know, a two day trek in to wherever you're going or, you know helicopter right i mean these are long days on the slopes yeah i mean what is there to, to to protect your crew it's all dependent on on the location the type of trip like you said there's all sorts of different versions of these types of shoots there's obviously things that are supported by helicopter there's things that are completely foot powered you know i do a lot of snowmobile access type of stuff tgr especially tries to put a lot of effort on whoever's there is there for the right reasons and for there because they're going to be a a valuable member of the team. At the beginning of every winter, we do a, a course, which is called the IPRW, the International Pro Riders Workshop is, is what we call it. Okay. And essentially it's just 
us rallying all of our production cinematographers, all of our athletes that we work with, safety guides, and we spend like a three-day intensive course just running through the basics. Anything from the basics to some some uh, elaborate sort of rescue scenarios. So we'll do you know beacon training and avalanche transceiver training, packaging and assessing kind of a wilderness first aid type of thing. And then wow. everything from like a, a whole scenario where, you know, you're on this slope, an avalanche happened, two people are buried, one person has this injury, and you have to kind of like build out and run the scenario as if it's a real true mm-hmm. thing. So that's something we do every single year. And it's just a way to kind of like dust off those cobwebs, make sure everybody's like going into the season with that safety mm-hmm. on the front of mind and, and really yeah. being cautious that like, you know, what we're going into and where we go and operate is serious terrain and, and definitely something that mm-hmm. uh, requires presence and, and uh, you know, attention yeah. to, to the, your surroundings. Is that something that you sign up for? Is that something that you guys do with your filmmakers specifically and exclusively? That's just for us. So this is just kind okay. of a internal cinematographers that we work with on an annual basis, athletes that we work with mm-hmm. on an annual basis. Um, there's a lot of other, you know, companies out there and people out there that do similar type of courses. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. like Jones Snowboards does a similar course. Uh, Pat Moore does a similar course up at Bald Face Lodge. And I think okay. it's, you know, again, I think everybody has the same idea that we love operating in these places. We love being in these places, but recognizing yeah. that that they're serious and that, you know, avalanche concerns and, and all sorts yeah. of different things can go wrong. And, and having that wherewithal of how to react when when something does go wrong is is kind of a mindset you need to be in at the beginning of the year. You have that on slope camera angle and then you have the Barbie shot where there's nobody around them. So I'm just like, how many times did they run that? <laughs> if we're doing our job right, it's only one time. You know, the the tough part with filming, skiing and snowboarding, as soon as they've ridden it once, there's a track in the mountain. It's kind of hard to do multiple laps on it. Yeah. You know, with the exception yeah. of like a jump or something like that where you're hitting it multiple mm-hmm. times. But yeah, typically, you know, we'll try to position each other in in spaces where we're not in each other's shot. So, uh, okay. for example, that onslope person, if I'm at the Barbie angle, this onslope person, I'll try to hide them behind a little tree or, you know, put them <laughs> in a little spot. I'm like, hey, you're great there, but if you bump over five feet to the left, you'll be behind a branch and I won't see you, you know? So we're kind of like yeah. comms yeah. that are always going because we're always kind of spread out throughout the valley or Absolutely. slope where we're at. Yeah. So those radio comms, you know, explaining to each other where you're at, what your angle looks like, Mm -hmm. um, just keeping that communication. And and like I said, there's a lot of hiding people behind bushes and trees and Mm -hmm. and, uh, (laughs) keeping that onslope person a little stashed in there so you don't see them in the the wider Barbie shop. What comms do you use? I mean, you're you're on the other side. You're on the other peak. <laughs> like, what reaches? Yeah, yeah. We just just larger, you know, VHF radios, um, <laughs> okay. similar to, to any other larger production. And yeah, um, okay. there's certainly times where like, you know, you're not quite getting everybody, and they're coming in a little broken. And you kind of have to like, you know, yeah. bump up to a little higher spot on the snowmobile or hike up a little higher to to get the get the signal but yeah it's just kind of yeah. a the VHF radios or a loud oh. shout you know in the valley <laughs> <laughs> that'll do it i mean there's nobody else out there right exactly there's certainly some times where you know the athlete's radio cuts out or the battery dies and you're just listening for this little scream of 3 2 1 drop <laughs> <laughs> well i guess whatever works i mean yeah cuz like I mean, they would just be sitting on the, sitting on the top of the ridge there, not knowing when they're supposed to go. So, exactly, I mean, exactly. Comms are key. Comms are key for yeah. sure. With these risks and like you know a lot of these types of, I mean, like helicopters to the summits. I mean, they're not cheap. And I also know that I mean, you guys still do some pretty extensive sound design sometimes as well. And then also, <laughs> you have the most bomb music. I love it. I mean, music licensing is not cheap either. What's a typical budget for a feature that would involve all of this? I think, again, it kind of comes back to the varying projects, right? It all depends on how many sponsors are involved, how many presenting sponsors are involved. But, you know, typically we try to bring in, you know, presenting sponsors we would partner with. Um, A lot of times those sponsors are obviously uh, sponsors of athletes that are in the film and Mm -hmm. their budgets are helping us to actually get footage of their athletes with which they then use in different marketing campaigns and things like that. 
But yeah, I mean, it, it ranges from a wide variety. You know, we, we do certain projects that are very low budgets, um, and then we do certain projects that are much, much higher budgets. And, and obviously, the more you start getting out there with helicopters and, and flying around, obviously, those, those become bigger, bigger production shoots. Yeah. Your foot-powered stuff is the lowest budget, and then your helicopter is kind of your, your higher budget shoots i'm just gonna throw out like a buoy just to see like where on the where on the scales because the micro budget for like narrative film is you know like 100k whereas you know in hollywood low budget is like less than five million or even three million or even one but even one is like pretty that but for a documentary you know like i've also seen you know that take up to like 100k like are you like yeah, somewhere. Can you? <laughs> I, I'd say we're somewhere in the middle there. I think it, you know. Again, okay. it depends on the project and what what uh, okay. sponsors come in. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're definitely more in the documentary space, and and we're okay. certainly not towards those uh, Hollywood budgets. But you know, as <laughs> yeah. the as the yeah. industry grows, as the footprint grows, as the audience grows, I think those budgets are going to con continue to grow, and yeah, hopefully it it grows in a way that we can continue to kind of push the boundaries of what we do and continue to grow. Yeah. So to get a, a better idea of how this world works, those sponsors are always like put up on the screen before when we're waiting for our show. Is that how TGR and similar companies get all their funding? Like the other ones, they're all in, you know, hedge funds, you know, <laughs> like that kind of like the major studios, that kind of thing. Are there other quote unquote like major studios within the outdoor space? And is this kind of the typical way that they get their funding? Yeah, I would say this is probably the typical way. I think, you know, majority of, of these outdoor industry kind of filmmaking companies rely on sponsors and, and investors that come in to sort of help fund these projects. We work a lot with Sierra Nevada Brewing. They've been super awesome partnership that have helped us tell a lot of really amazing stories. They've come in to support kind of deeper storytelling kind of films. And, and uh, you know, yeah. so we love to partner with uh, those types of companies that believe in, in sharing these kind of stories and, and uh, help us kind of find the means to do it. So for filmmakers who are wanting to be part of this whole hub, if there is anything that you could tell them about like what they could expect if they were to be one of these filmmakers, like just to, you know, set the bar for expectation, you know, expect to not have any of like this paid for, um, like you can, you can expect they'll give you a place to stay or they'll feed you for X amount of meals or days or, you know, something like that even like a ballpark of starting pay for, for what they could expect. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, I think that's, uh, it's all circumstantial on the, the shoot, the type of shoot, the budget behind the shoot. Um, but typically yeah. all the, all the productions that I've been on are typically your meals are covered, your lodging, um, travel to get there. Typically if you're on, let's say it's a three week shoot, um, you know, all your expenses are typically covered on those types of shoots. But that being said, getting into it, like there's all sorts of varieties and levels of what you might make. Yeah. You know, I will say I did live in my car for a month and a half when I first started doing this. So, and I think that's yeah. not a unique story to uh, people that are getting into the action sports film yeah. world. But again, yeah. as as it continues to grow and it builds more, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, we continue to see sort of those budgets build and those returns on, on the people that are really putting themselves in the those tough positions and those roles that you know financially they're they're compensated for you mentioned three weeks what is the typical shooting length for one of your feature tgr films i i would say three weeks is kind of a good ballpark the cook city trip or the montana trip that i did or stoke the fire that was actually a much quicker trip i think we were only there for about 12 days 13 days and that one happened to line up you know a lot of times uh -huh. you'll get to those locations and conditions don't line up. Snow is not good. Uh, avalanche conditions are unstable, so you can't get into, you know, bigger terrain. You know, we happened to kind of luck out on that one. We showed up. Avalanche conditions were really unstable, very scary. We were tiptoeing mm. around trying to just find a really small, low consequence kind of terrain to start getting into it. Um, and yeah. then as the days went on, things started to get more stable, and we were able to kind of build up in our terrain. Uh, we Obviously, yeah. we call it terrain progression. Anytime we go on a trip or we go to a location, you always kind of start small and build your way up mm -hmm. just because, you know, you don't want to jump into a place that you don't quite know the snowpack, you don't quite know the terrain, 
and jump onto the oh, biggest, yeah. gnarliest, scariest line because, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's how people get hurt and that's how people get killed. So an average would be around that kind of three-week range. But uh, again, some of the, you know, bigger trips to Alaska or international, sometimes those can be a month-long trip or better. Justin clarified after recording that he spoke to this question about a particular trip and not necessarily the full length of the film production. So typically the annual ski film, for example, um, is a four to six month process with multiple three to four week trips happening within that window. <laughs> about those avalanches. I mean, and I'm we're we're all like just very acutely aware of the risks <laughs> that are out there. So for people who are part of the union and um, people who have a salaried position like you, um, you know, like insurance isn't necessarily a thing. But for the contractors uh, that are like out on the mountain, do you recommend any particular insurance? Like, is there some sort of clause in there like must cover like dismemberment by avalanche? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm I, so I'm blanking on some of the names right now, but I know there's some sort of adventure based insurance companies out there. They insure people that go on trips like this that are kayakers or bikers or climbers or skiers. You can kind of add those policies when you go on trips. And a lot of yeah. times when TGR does a bigger trip, they'll have a policy like that in place. You know, there's a, all sorts of other ones. I think people kind of, especially in the contract world, get creative on those combinations of coverage um, <laughs> yeah. that sort of help them, you know, make sure that if the worst happens that they're, they're covered. Yeah. So when you said that TGR has something set up, is that something where like, if you're on a TGR production, are you covered under their insurance or, or is everybody kind of like man for themselves? I believe so. I believe it's, if it's uh, and I, I don't know this a hundred percent, but I believe if it's uh, let's say we're going to Austria, you know, when you have a crew of, of six production team, Mm -hmm. Typically, I believe that those production crew would be on a TGR um, insurance policy. Uh, we're going to ask some tools of your trade, which sure. I'm guessing are fantastically different <laughs> than what some people are, are used to. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe. We don't know. I'll ask what gear and gadget is kind of like your old reliable and then uh, which one is kind of the newest one that you like that revolutionizes how you work. For our lighter foot powered trips where we're walking and we're we're carrying all the equipment, we try to run yeah. as light as possible. Most recently we've been running the FX3 cameras, which is a Sony camera, awesome image quality, very compact and lightweight. Typically for myself, my kit is usually like a red, red epic. And then I typically have a 7200 lens in there, a 24 to 105 lens, and then a wide lens. Um, as well as as many batteries as I feel like I can physically carry without collapsing. <laughs> so I'd say those are kind of the the two different kits. You know, you have your lightweight kit and kind of your your heavier, bigger glass kit. But the other kind of huge one that we obviously use a bunch are drones. We use everything from uh, the newest Mavic, uh, a lot of DJI mm -hmm. stuff, a lot of in Inspires. I'd say our biggest weapon in our arsenal is the the gyro stabilized system, the GSS camera. And that is a stabilized system, you know, similar to a shot over or those type of cameras that you can mount to the bottom of a helicopter or to a general like side by side kind of thing. You know, you're in in the vehicle operating that camera. That's kind of our, our biggest weapon, I would say, that we use. And and we use it quite a lot. It's definitely something that Alaska, it gets used a lot. And it's yeah. it just amazing image quality and, and really that kind of call it planet earth type of, of coverage that we, <laughs> we like to like to have. You mentioned batteries. I remember, okay, we were, we were doing this trek and we were going high elevation. I think it's a lot of the cold. Those batteries did not last long. Yeah. What, what do you do for those batteries? Yes. Yeah, so if it's a camping trip, for example, um, depending on where you're at, you know, permits and that kind of stuff, a lot of times you can have a generator. So we'll, we'll recharge batteries in those senses. Um, okay. But there's a lot of times where you can't have a generator and yeah. a lot of those types of camping trips, if they are, you know, winter camping, our cinematographers are sleeping with their batteries. So they have yes. batteries shoved in their <laughs> sleeping bag, trying to keep them warm because as soon yeah. as they get cold, they start zapping and going really yeah. quick. Managing your battery is a, is a huge, huge thing that we deal with on the daily out there. And there's certainly days where you know, it's at the end of the day, we have a beautiful shot lined up and I turn my camera on. I'm like, all right, I got 12 seconds, better go. And oh, hopefully shoot. you get it. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So like what happens when you don't? 
well, hopefully you can come back the next day <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else has a, you know, an angle on it. You know, like I said, we typically kind of have a couple angles on the thing, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you just sort of play the hand you're dealt. And if, if your battery's done and somebody else has one, then you have confidence that hopefully they have the angle and they have the shot and, and somebody else gets it if your, your battery's down. One of my favorite questions, and actually one of our listener questions from Instagram, what's the most dangerous situation that you've been in? And my personal question that I always ask that I've just, it's become a favorite, a story where something went wrong. Sure. I think as far as most dangerous, that one's hard to pinpoint because I think, you know, the reality of, of the places that we're in, you're kind of always in danger or not necessarily always in danger, but there's always something that could go wrong. Um, so been in a lot of positions where it's like, this feels wrong, you know, something feels off here and it's like, let's, let's, let's move locations. Let's get to a better spot where we're not in this kind of a, you know, avalanche path or mm -hmm. this above head kind of danger or whatever that may be. I'd say one of the scarier ones that I've been in was, was getting out of a helicopter with a, we had this Google rig that was a VR thing. I and mean, we had this like google camera rig that was just like 27 gopros on this tripod and we're like <laughs> getting off on this ridge and the helicopter is just kind of hovering it's called a tow in is what they call it is when you okay tow of the helicopter is on the tip of the mountain and the back of the skis oh are kind of hanging and so i was tasked with getting out and setting up this little rig so i could get the shot of the helicopter leaving in vr so somebody could put goggles on and be like wow yeah. <laughs> you know so i'd say that was <laughs> yeah. one of the scarier ones hindsight oh everything gosh. was totally fine but it was one of the earlier helicopter experiences it was just a, a little <laughs> exciting um, <laughs> as far as something going wrong um i've been very lucky in the mountains spent a lot of days out there and never had anything extremely tragic or wrong go go on but uh Last winter, I had probably one of my scarier moments. We were filming around Jackson, filming with Kai Jones and, and Tim Durchy. That kid and is insane. Is he not, right? He's he oh is a gosh. charger. The guy's got little legs of steel and is so just fired up. He loves getting out there, loves being after it, and, and he doesn't stop for sure. The kid is, he's he's a hard-charging little grom, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, it. It had just been a big storm. We had gotten about two feet of snow the night before. And so we were all on high alert, right? Um, we we're going out. We we're going to just kind of tiptoe around in some uh, location here in our backyard in Jackson Hole. And we kind of got to our zone that we were thinking we were going to operate in. We dug a snow pit, uh, which is a thing we do a lot in the mountains is you dig a snow pit. It gives you a, a profile of kind of how that storm snow is settling. Uh, mm -hmm. There's all sorts of different tests you can do that help just give you a loose understanding of stability. And, mm. you know, if, if you do this test, it's like it reveals whether or not it's uh, likely triggering avalanches and how big wow. and all these different sort of factors. Wow. Uh, so we had dug a pit in the morning. We felt pretty good about the, the conditions, um, but we still tried to take a, a conservative approach at the day and went to mm -hmm. kind of a, a mellow slope that wasn't a very steep pitch. It wasn't a very long pitch. Um, we kind of figured we'd start there. The athletes, so Tim and Kai were at the top of kind of the mountain they were going to ride, which is again, this small pitch. It was really just going to be a couple of, you know, powder turns and it wasn't any big cliffs or anything like that. It was just riding deep, fresh pow. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of at the bottom figuring out sort of our, our locations where we wanted to be. And meanwhile, Tim is on the top and he takes a couple of steps and happens to remote trigger a really large wind slab. So it wasn't necessarily an unstable snow layer or anything like that. It was from wind depositing snow over this little peak into a deep pocket. And so yeah. he kicked off this little wind slab layer and I kind of looked up and I saw just a wall of snow coming right towards me. And I'm on my snowmobile oh my kind gosh. of figuring out my angle and I just see this wall coming towards me. Luckily, there was a, a bunch of trees in front of us. Um, I was kind of trying to put myself in a position where I wasn't um, directly in the line of, you know, the avalanche if something did go. But anyways, I, I look up and I see this wall coming at me and I snowmobile is not running. So I immediately try to like start my <laughs> snowmobile. I give it one pull and all of a sudden this wall just hits me 
and oh my I've got my heavy backpack on and it throws me. I probably flew about 10, 15 feet. My snowmobile rolled a couple of times and I oh end up kind of face down and I just sort of feel snow coming over the back of me. Luckily, oh again, because I was in a position where I was sort of protected behind trees, the brunt of the wind slab and the, the snow that came down missed me and sort of mm -hmm. just kind of buried the back of my legs. And I just kind of, kind of mm -hmm. stood up and I was, was not buried, <laughs> but immediately I start panicking of like, where's everyone else at? You know, and you yes. start immediately yeah. jumping on the radio, like, you know, checking in, making sure everyone's safe. Thankfully, everybody was safe in that scenario. Tim, Kai at top, were all safe. I was really wow. the only one that got kind of knocked off their snowmobile, but it buried a handful of our snowmobiles and, and was certainly like a quick reminder that even if you're being careful and being cautious, the, like there's things that can still go wrong. So I'd say that was wow. definitely one of my scarier personal moments mm -hmm. that I've had out there. Wow. Do any of the crew wear, I don't even know the right terminology, you know, those like airbags oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of deploy during the... Yeah, absolutely. The, none none the, of, uh, okay. Okay. I would say none of the cameramen really do just because of, you know, the added weight of a battery or a canister of air, those kind of things. Typically, all of our athletes usually have one of those. Okay. And I personally haven't been in a scenario where they've been used, but I know there's countless times where those things have have made a huge difference yeah. and, and yeah. saved lives. So yeah, a lot of our athletes, yeah, yeah. Um, especially in the bigger mountains like Alaska, the bigger terrain stuff, uh, will always have that airbag mm -hmm. kind of ready to deploy in, in case, you know, the worst happens. Okay, uh, on to our next listener question that might actually kind of uh, piggyback on that. What is the most challenging part of your job? I guess I'll give you a twofold. For the office side of things, um, <laughs> so I spend a lot of time, I really got my start editing and I, I love editing and I love being in that creative space. But, you know, the challenging part of those is probably the last two weeks of basically any movie I've ever made because you just live in that edit bay and you're yep. there 12 to 14 to 16, however many hours mm -hmm. a day and mm -hmm. just trying to give everything you can to, you know, make it as, as pretty as you can and polished as you can and yeah. dialed as you can. And, and, uh, so I think that's definitely the hardest part of the edit side is that, that mm -hmm. final two week grind to a picture lock. As far as being in the field, which I also love just as much, really gives me kind of a creative break from that time in the edit bay and that time <laughs> in the office and to be able to actually like be outside and be in these places that virtually I am in a lot of time. Finding that balance has been super key for me. I think when I'm in the field, I think the hardest thing that I would say we deal with is weather conditions and moving around in the mountains you know like i mentioned earlier a lot of times our backpacks are 40 50 pound packs and we're having to walk whatever it is 500 feet thousand feet of elevation to get to an angle in thigh deep snow so mm -hmm. it can be wow. really exhausting yeah. just as far as moving around in the mountains and then the other big part is is obviously the cold you know dealing in in these kind of environments oh. with wind ripping in, in 20 degrees below, whatever it may be. And you have to have your hands out messing with mm. metal, you know? So yeah. you're swapping batteries, swapping lenses. You're trying to keep all the snow from getting inside of there. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, I think that's and definitely still make a challenge. sure that you have a good shot. Sure. Yeah. 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 And still make sure that you have a good shot. So there's, there's a lot of juggling, just, just moving the weight around the mountains and getting into position to, you know, to get the angle that you, that you want. Every angle move takes something, right? You know, so it can be mm -hmm. like, oh, I wish, wish I was right over there. It's like that could be 45 minutes, <laughs> you know, just ah! to like walk all the way to that spot and find that spot. And then you get there, you're like, ah, I actually kind of like the other spot better, you know. Mercy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say the the being in the field part, uh, I'd say the, the toughest thing is just dealing with the elements and the challenge of moving around in the mountains. So we have another question that you kind of have already said, but I'll expand on it. So they wanted to know your your path that got you to TGR, which you have, you know, you kind of mentioned. But I would I would like to know, like, even just the conversation that got you that job. I mean, was it something was a matter of just like calling up a buddy or was it like a cold call? Uh <laughs> That's funny because, uh, you know, I know I mentioned that the I went to the deeper show and after that deeper movie, I was really fired up on like, all right, like I used to be into this. I used to really like filming and editing and I, I loved that process. So right after the show, I actually went and talked to uh, one of the guys that was putting the show on, the tour guy at the time. I think his name was Brett Nesty. 
and uh, talked to Brett and said, hey, man, like, is, does TGR ever do like internships? And he's like, absolutely, man. Here's an email. Hit this guy up. Let him know uh, that you're interested and, and, you know, take the combo from there. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I sent that email that ended up being to uh, this guy named Blake Campbell, amazing editor. He was TGR's lead editor for a number of years. Um, he mm. does a bunch of freelance work these days, but a uh, awesome editor and just a, just a great human in general. And I had my first kind of conversation with him. Now, having had more conversations with the founder of the company, Todd Jones, at that time, the internship program took about four people. And mm. typically they would always try to pull one person that didn't come from the traditional sort of film school type of background. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. ended up being that one, you know, the, uh, the other three that were there had all studied film in some capacity, you know, okay. more than I had for sure. Um, one was an NYU film stu school student. Dang. The others have both come from similar sort of film programs. And so I was a little bit of the Hail Mary one that they added to the, the list that year. <laughs> You know, I just worked hard and committed myself to learning as much as I could. And, and I'd learned a ton during my internship and that rolled pretty quickly into some contract jobs, which then rolled into helping to cut the next of the deeper, further higher trilogy further. Um, and then ultimately my first kind of lead edit project that I led up was, uh, the film Hire with, uh, Jamie Jones. So you said that they, um, they only accept four. Kind of how many do they accept now? I'd say it's similar, if not even a little bit less um, these okay, days. Okay. Yeah, we actually, I think there's about 30 full-time employees at, at TGR. Okay. And typically we'll do a round of kind of summer interns, two to three summer interns that sort of just help ingest footage, you know, learn as much as they possibly can. They also have kind of like website. So the, the website will also bring in some interns, one or two a year. So I'd say like throughout the year, we have anywhere between three to six mm -hmm. kind of interns at yeah. various points of the year. Do you ever have interns go out with you on um, on trips? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, again, if, if they are knowledgeable, you know, and a lot mm -hmm. of kind of what I was alluding to earlier the, of getting into this industry and getting into this space is getting into these sports, right? So a lot of the people... Yeah that our interns or that are coming in wanting to get into this world have already taken an avalanche course or they have some sort of knowledge of backcountry travel. You know, we would never take somebody into the backcountry that doesn't feel comfortable out there and that doesn't mm -hmm. meet the criteria of, of anybody who comes into the backcountry with us. But that being said, kind of my first year out there before I'd really gotten much avalanche knowledge and that kind of stuff, I did help on some shoots like around the resort. So we weren't in like mm -hmm scary backcountry conditions but you know we were filming things around the resort those kind of things definitely we had, happened a bunch what current project are you excited about Ooh, um very excited we actually just released the film two weeks ago a film called mountain revelations i was lucky enough to be the director on the film and as well as one of the editors on the project um, and that is currently on tour right now we're kind of still piecing together the digital distribution plan for that, but hoping to share that film with a much, much wider audience uh, here real soon. When you say digital distribution, uh, you have the traditional tour that mm -hmm. goes around, but with digital distribution, I mean, do you guys go for the typical streaming platforms? Is that something that you guys pursue? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, again, we're, we're kind of entertaining all the options on this one, trying to figure out mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day for this one, I think the goal is just to try to get as many eyes on it as possible, to share the story with as many people as possible. So this one, hopefully, you know, will be on some of those more traditional streaming platforms, potentially some sort of just wide free release at some point. Still kind of working through all those options and, and trying to figure out what the best path forward is. But ultimately, the goal is to just try to get it in front of as many people as possible. Okay, well, how do people find you or follow your work? We definitely want to follow. Yeah, we well, appreciate it. I mean, welcome to find me on my Instagram. It's just a fan. My, my website's out there, justinfan.com. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's the internet's out there. Just type in my name. I'm sure you'll find me somewhere. <laughs> I really appreciate the massive curtain pull on a lot of these a uh, lot of these things i mean this is a completely different world and you shed a lot of light on it well thank you i appreciate having me on the show and uh yeah it's, it's cool like i said you you guys operate in a very different space and listening to some of the other episodes it's uh it's interesting to kind of 
compare the worlds a little bit because there's certainly <laughs> different worlds, but they all are uh, surrounded different. by the same thing of, of trying to tell impactful stories. So appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. If you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and on Instagram. Ask us questions and check out more episodes at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. Be well and God bless. We'll see you next time on The Practical Filmmaker.